Welcome to Origin Stories. I'm RD. I'm Parrot. We're telling stories behind the digital art revolution. Each week we interview top artists and live stream with the community. Let's go. Today is tomorrow's Origin Story. Story. Ravi Vora, welcome to Origin Stories. Thank you so much. I'm excited to, to chat with you and, and tell you a little about my story. It was time for this ever since we interacted in Miami, a little bit before that, but in Miami, seeing your art larger than life. We'll talk about that. We'll get to that at the Animus Party um, and just seeing you interact there. It was from that moment forward. It was just a matter of when. Yeah, it was it was great. We even had a great conversation right then and there. And I just feel like we have a lot of really like minded ideals. And I love just the energy that you brought. So I'm excited to talk to you about it. Thanks, man. I can't wait to learn a few things along the way. Which, and the journey begins with a single question, and that is, Ravi, what is your origin story? Well, that's that's such a, a fun question to kind of dive into. Um, there's a lot of layers of how I got to where I am uh, and where I'm going. I think my origin story often, I would say, comes from um, just I'm, I grew up in the smallest town, like one streetlight in the middle of nowhere in Michigan, and I really became the artist that I was forged in like solitude because none of my friends I went to a school it was an hour away so I would just travel every morning go to school come back and find the things that I loved and was passionate about and develop my hobbies and, and things and played around a computer a little bit here and there trying to develop some uh, finding just kind of like exploring hobbies but turning them into passions so I didn't really delve into a lot of um art that I'm doing now. Uh, I didn't have a camera really growing up, but when I did finally get it, my dad gave me a camera that, um, so I'm going to tell you his kind of story a little bit, how he met my mom and then why that camera is so important to me and became part of my life. Um, and, and that is that my mom and dad ended up, my dad's from India. He's he immigrated when he was 25, had, you know, no money in his pocket. He's like my hero for sure. And he just worked really hard and got his, uh, was the top of his class. It's like the, it's called IIT, is the college, and similar to MIT here, but in, in India. And he ended up asking his doctor for a thousand dollars to be able to move to America. I got accepted to the graduate program in Ohio State, um, and my mom also happened to be in the graduate program there, both pursuing their PhDs. And they ended up living in the same kind of house. And uh, she came down. She lived with girls up top on the second floor, and he lived with all his guy roommates on the, the first floor. And she came down and would see him and thought he was cute and then saw that he had a camera and he was, you know, learning double exposures and all the stuff that he was excited about. And she asked him, Hey, would you want to come shoot uh, my friend's like, you know, party or whatever? I'd love for you to just come by. you see you have a camera. And so he was like, okay, yeah. And he brought his camera and took some pictures. And on the way back, he's like, I had a good time with you. We should get married. <laughs> she was like, in America, we date first a little bit and we kind of get to know each other. Then we, you know, get married. And he's like, okay, then we'll date for a little while and, and then we'll get married. Wow. <laughs> yeah, he was just used to how it was in India where it was like arranged marriage and all the other things in his family. So, yeah, it ended up being that the camera really brought them together. And then he uh, ended up giving me that camera, a little old Minolta. And he put a camera in my hands when I was younger and I didn't really know much about it or really care about photography because I thought true art came from starting from nothing and creating something from your imagination. And I didn't realize what you can do and how you can storytell and how you can craft using the world around us. And with a camera, you can capture and tell stories. So when I finally started to, the first day I had it in my hands, went around my neighborhood, again, small little area with trees and, and up a lake and all these things that kind of still stay with me to this day in my work nature is a big important part and i just discovered and fell in love with photography and so that was that was the beginning so number one that camera was your parents origin story yeah my which parents, is incredible which is legitimately how you know i'm here in the first place <laughs> it's amazing yeah um number two a question when you got the camera itself and you went around your neighborhood into nature i'm thinking about it one of two ways and i don't know the answer and i want to know was there trepidation about clicking the button the first time and capturing the first photo? So it was like, what should I capture first? Or was it just go out there and click, 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 anything you could find? Yeah, it was, it was the dead of winter. So everything was 
it was a fresh snow on everything. And I, again, it was like just rediscovering the world for me. It was really looking at everything. We, we have this, you know, little deck on the uh, front of our house that my parents were really proud of building finally um, as a project. And the sunlight came through each slat of the deck. And there was this just stark uh, pattern on the snow of these lines. And I was like, oh, there's, you know, something I can compose. So I took this black and white photo, which I never do now. But at the time, I was just learning composition and light. Um, the very first time I picked up a camera and I took that photo and I was like, wow, this is, it's like perspective. You finally realize that the reason photography is so important is because your artist's perspective on the world is what tells the story, not the camera doing the work, which I thought for some reason in my head, I thought that you just hold up this piece of technology in front of something that's already beautiful and you just click a button. So it was more like I was challenging the, the ideal that I had about it and realizing that most people that were, at least that I knew that were photographers did that. They just held something up in front of something that they were told, here's the Grand Canyon, here's something beautiful, go stand in front of it, take a picture. It looks pretty good, but it looks like every other photo I've seen of that same place or that thing where I was like, how do I do this different? How do I connect the artist to the subject and get this camera almost out of the way completely? You know, it's, it's really interesting to me. And I'm so glad, I mean, we'll get to the NFT space and your journey to there a little bit later in this, in this story, but it just strikes me right now. So I have to say it, the respect level of photography in NFTs has dramatically risen in the past two, two ish months. I would say you, you, you literally could chart a trend line up. And um, I can't believe we were ever in a situation prior to that, where I wouldn't say it was disrespected at all. I just think it was unrecognized for what it was. But talking to individuals like yourself, like Jay and Silva, like Dave Krugman for two minutes about your craft. And it's obvious. It's just obvious. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much passion. Um, I mean, I've done this for now 10 years. I've, you know, met up with Silva and Krugman and all these people across the, the gamut of photography and even helped craft some of these photography careers by, you know, the, the amazing opportunities I've gotten. And then I'm realizing that I can give those opportunities to other photographers that are passionate and are doing the same thing. When I see them going out and using their artistic vision and changing and challenging the way that everyone else is doing it and using true, truly hearing and seeing what their story is through their lens. Those are the people I've always wanted to give opportunities to because I know they're going to push it forward and they're not going to follow a trend necessarily. They're always going to find their own way and they're going to make the mistakes. And I always say that make more mistakes, like do the thing that makes you feel uncomfortable because you're going to find the spark of inspiration and magic that comes from it. And seeing photography where it was to where it is now, you see the people that are doing that, that aren't, we're, we're actually, some of them are hated on because of the way they did their photography. And, and we'll keep seeing that that there's these traditionalists and these people that say art is supposed to be the, the pure form. Mm -hmm. Photography is only film. It's only, you know, it becomes digital, but only one single shot or only this. And that word only or just, those are just, they're, they're horrible words to put in art because that's the point of art is to challenge it and, and use a new medium or collaborate and combine them and mash them together and use multiple inspiration sources. I, I look at films and filmmaking and music and those are what inspire me more than I see other photography. So when you put that all together, it really becomes an expression more than it is whatever the technical form of the art is. Yeah, anything that implies always or never is an immediate eyebrow raise. Yeah, <laughs> You're just, it's, it's surprising that people want to stick their, gu their guns about it. And I think it comes, it comes down to fear, right? It's, mm -hmm. this is how I interpret it. And if you do something outside of that and I can't understand it, or I'm afraid that challenges my own um, methods, mm -hmm. it becomes, it's just, you can either be open-minded about it or you can be afraid of it. Yep. All right, back to that day, snow's on the ground, camera's in your hand, you capture the first shot, take us from there. So from there, um, I found, I've, I've started learning about the world as well because of nature, right? You have all of these amazing things happening with light and you start to discover what light does and why it interacts the way it does with things. And I was uh, on the path to being a geneticist. So that was my goal. Went to, went to college, you know, I enrolled to learn about genetics and uh, I'd met the guy who cloned Dolly the sheep. So I, I met him and I was like, that's, this is awesome. This guy's like going to clone, you know, livers and hearts and things and help people. And I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to help people by 
enabling their bodies to continue to re recreate whatever it is. And then I realized through college that it wasn't really my um, passion to, to learn all this rote memorization in science, even though both my parents, one owned her own microbiology laboratory, the other one was an engineering firm and he owned his own, like they really fully wanted me to be science and engineer or math basically. And, uh, and, you know, when I was taking pictures of ice crystals and learning that, and, and then I, you know, went to college and I realized that there's something that I have to do and it's be creative and I have to follow my artistic passion. And it wasn't, it was definitely, uh, you know, my second year in college when I had a conversation with my parents where I said, I'm going to pursue advertising or theater or something creative that allows me to storytell. And uh, they both were like, no, you're not. <laughs> you're going to, you're going to keep doing <laughs> math and science and you're going to do that. And then eventually after, you know, really breaking it down to them and saying, this is what, this is what fulfills me. And this is what I know I need to do. Um, you know, my mom came around and she became supportive and she said, you know, you do what you want. Um, but we're going to support you and love you either, no matter what. My dad definitely felt at the time, and he's very much different now. He's, he's very supportive. One of the, my number one fan, and, and I love him so much for it. But at the time, it was definitely not the most supportive because he, he had my best interest in mind, but it was challenging for him mm -hmm. to see and grow up in a, a world where science and math had led, led him from India, where he lived not in the best situation at all, to all the way to America, where he's following the um, American dream and able to pursue his, his career and give me the life that he thinks I deserve, et cetera. And um, for him to, to see that was really difficult. So when I said I'm pursuing a path that does not have a defined goal, does not have absolute metrics of success, when you get out of college, you don't have a, a budget range of this is how much you're going to make in your salary. It's art. It's mm -hmm. up to you as an artist. And so it's scary for him. And uh, he there was an art competition at the time in my school where I was, um, I entered and it was for an arts and crafts fair, designed the poster and anybody could do it in the entire school and you win a hundred dollars. Huge prize. <laughs> for me in college, I was like, I don't really care about the prize, but I know, you know, a hundred dollars. You never know what you can uh, do with that. So this, so, is, this is second year of college range? Yeah. When, you, when you've made the decision, but he's struggling with it a little bit? Exactly. Got it. He's, he's struggling and I've made the decision that I'm going to, I'm going to continue with my engineering path and, and science, but I'm going to also enter in this competition to see kind of test the waters. So I, I'll design this poster. I know it's open to the entire college. All the artists are going to enter it. They're going to win, of course, like there's no way I have a chance, but I'm going to try. Mm -hmm. And so I enter the competition. I put my, you know, work in, I, I do this painting of a handprint with a flower and some other stuff that I thought was pretty cool at the time and all digital too, which is kind of a, you know, I, I got to find that piece because um, it's, it's one of my first origins for sure. Um, and I did that. And during that competition, it was going to be revealed just after kind of summer around summer. That's when they were going to reveal the winner. Um, and unfortunately during that time, uh, right before it was revealed, my mom was unfortunately uh, killed in a, an accident. So I lost her. She was riding a bicycle um, training for a bicycle ride that my parents did every year. And it was a, it's called Dalmac. It's this hundred mile a day ride for five days um, from Lansing in Michigan all the way up to Mackinac, which is a little island across this bridge. And uh, it was always a part of my you know, journey growing up. I knew they were training for it. And unfortunately uh, she was struck by a driver while she was training. And uh, so from that time, I basically uh, found out in the summer that I won the competition and the art program and everything looked at my poster and put it up all over the school and everywhere. And I decided to stay in uh, and do summer classes because I had to catch up in order to change uh, my majors. And uh, so it was everywhere. All of my work was on posters in the mall, in the huge, uh, people were wearing t-shirts with my work on it, hats, everything. And I, um, it was a constant reminder. And my, the words that she said were the last ones that, you know, she wanted me to pursue my, my dream and live my, my truth and, and be an artist. And, uh, and that really, not being able to show her that that competition that I won, that there was potential there that I was able to, you know, go from being something to potentially being an artist um, will always be kind of a hole in my heart that I know that I need to fill. 
with art and creativity. You have a higher order mission. I mean, the, the, the intersection of those two events. I mean, that's, that's a, a life altering moment. Yeah, man. I, I'm I, one, I'm, I'm sorry that that happened. Um, and two, the fact that you can fill that hole or attempt to fill that hole with something as beautiful as what you do is what you've carried forward. Like I hope as some time has passed and that whole uh, gains color and I don't know, I guess just everything that you're able to put there. I hope that, uh, yeah, I hope that you reflect on that with, um, I don't even know what I'm saying. I, I'm shook. I'm shook by, by, by what you just said and, and, and how those two events dovetail together. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that, Roger. I do. Um, it, it's something that, you know, it'll always be there. It'll be always, always be part of me, whether it's at the forefront or not. And, and that's something that I can always be thankful for being able to, you know, make her proud basically yeah. with the work that I do and that um, I'm always telling stories and, and fulfilling other people's lives in a way that help them get through hard times or whatever it is that they seek and story tell. And, you know, my dad is, like I said, he's taken the role of both of my parents on his, on his own shoulders and he's been a real hero to me. So uh, ever since then, he's just really like I, I recommend everyone go check out his Instagram because he writes poetry and he talks about my mom and uh, he, he, lives in Michigan still and takes pictures of a, a sunset where our cabin, we have a, a beautiful view of a, a sunset that my mom's dad built mm -hmm. uh, the cabin and it's on the lake. And he takes a picture of the sunset almost every night and puts, you know, a caption on there that has a lot to do with just the higher order of the world and the universe. And he's, he's truly a spiritual poet. He's become a very spiritual man. And um, yeah, he just is very supportive of us. In case someone's just listening and doesn't have access to show notes, just say his Instagram handle here. Yeah, his Instagram handle is at Arvind Vora, A R V I N D Vora, V O R A. All right, we're, let's all let's all go check that out. Yeah. Um, and, and cry, I'd be surprised. He's very, he's, he's a special guy. And my uh, just to stay on that uh, that tough topic for one more one more moment along your journey. Have you created a piece of art at any moment in time that it sort of clicked in and you were able to say this artwork? she would have appreciated so deeply like, like this, this thing that I've captured that I've created that I've birthed would really resonate. So I think the one thing that I would say about her is she was always doing something, right? She's, she's constantly interested in things. She would help with our, um, you know, the financial account, uh, financial committee at the church and then do, uh, be in a golf league and get her ham radio operator license and also be in a tennis league and work on so many things and run her own business like incredible woman um truly like at the beginning too when it wasn't easy for her grandmother i think was one of the first female golfers like all of all of these powerful women in our history was kind of like she was the pinnacle of all of these things at once which is amazing um and then she worked on a stained glass as well that was her creative outlet was doing stained glass so she did that for our church and i think subconsciously, I've always integrated a lot of color into my work. And it's been a really important part to me. Um, so throughout my work, color and, and the way that you look at light and the way all of that kind of combines together has been influenced a lot with how I saw her working, um, soldering and doing all these things. And I saw just the way you don't always expect it, but when you see the colors coming together in a really beautiful way, and then light hits it and all these things, it becomes this magical piece of art. And although I never really did a lot of hands-on work, I did this digitally and I found that color and photography, especially, uh, that's something I'm known for in my ethereal kind of colors and work and knowing the theory between how they interact and what emotions, uh, I think it's just in a lot, all of my work underlying is, is that influence. That's amazing. It's amazing. It's a, it's a, like I said, it's a powerful higher order mission that uh, it's no surprise that, that I, early on when we met and interacted on Ravi's a deep, is a deep, soulful guy. And this, this, yeah, this, this makes some sense. Um, your approach. All right. So ground us, you win the competition. And what, what year is this? Oof. Uh, it's funny. Cause it's like, those years are very hazy on dates. My dad is like the best 
at dates. He yeah. can tell you what sandwich he ate on, you know, July 10th in <laughs> 1984. Um, but for me, it was around 20, 2007, eight, probably right around then. So was when I was graduating. Bridge the gap. One of my favorite things to do is I like, especially, I mean, for an Instagram account as prolific as yours, I like to go all the way back. And mm. I have to say, it took me a lot of scrolls to get there. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I made it, but I made it. And so, all right, you just rooted us in 2007, 2008, mm. uh, a possible jump point. You may have something before this, so feel free to, to dial me back. But October 12th, 2010 was your first Instagram post called All Signs Point. Yeah, so I think... I'm not sure if that actually is my very first. I might have deleted some before that just because right around that time um, we were just like playing around with Instagram. So there might be, I might have posted before that and then deleted like a couple weeks later or whatever. Um, but definitely around 2010 was when I really started using Instagram. And I was going through, I was at a full-time job as a creative director and I was going through a big kind of another obstacle of understanding whether full-time was for me sitting in front of a desk, working and doing all of this for someone else. When um, I moved to LA with not knowing anybody, uh, I wanted to make films. I wanted to do things that were creative. But when I got there, I realized that being a creative director, even though I was helping and I did some amazing things in my career, like uh, the, the Chinese theater that's very famous for the handprints here in LA. Uh, I ended up doing the logo and branding for them. And then the Arclight theater and then all these things. And I was like, I'm surrounded by movies. I'm surrounded by the things that I love. But I'm not actually doing them. I'm not actually pursuing that yet. So I started taking pictures with my iPhone of stuff that I just saw on a daily basis. And I would go maybe on the weekends with, uh, you know, the girl I was dating at the time and go take pictures. Um, and then I was like, one day I just woke up and thought, I'm just going to quit my job and see what happens. I moved to LA, had no friends, had nowhere to stay and saw what happened. And I, I've done, I just started cutting ties and just going and being more of a risk taker, I guess. And right around then I, I quit my job and I said, I'm just going to do whatever comes my way. And within a week, I got a phone call. I started working uh, for some tech uh, ad agencies, kind of doing script writing because mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to do movies. I'm going to write scripts. I don't care if it's in commercials, as long as I'm making moving pictures, that's all that matters. So I started writing commercials and I had this company call me and I thought it was just like a prank call almost. And they're like, Hey, we have this thing coming up. We want you to sh write this commercial. And it had happened to be for Nike. And I was like, yeah, right. Okay. I've shot, like, I wrote, I wrote like two or three commercials and you want me to shoot, you know, write something for Nike, uh, which to me was like one of the number one aesthetic mm -hmm. brands I've always grown up with. And uh, I ended up being true and I wrote something for them. And in true Nike fashion, they killed the project right before it, <laughs> it got <laughs> made. And I was like, oh, that was it. That would have been the, the complete game changer. And so he, that was a curveball, man. I thought yeah. I was like, oh, Ravi was made here and, and off he went. And uh, nope, nope. <laughs> not Can't, they were like, not going to do it. And so I was like, OK, well, you know, back to the grind. And they uh, the agency called me up and they said, we loved your ideas. We want you to come in and concept on this new thing that we're doing for this uh, social platform. I think it's called Instagram. Um, and we want you to just come in and give us some ideas of how Nike could come into the space and, you know, do photography in uh and do things in the world of social media. And I was like, okay, yeah, I'll come in and write some ideas. And I wrote some ideas and I was like, it doesn't really make sense if you don't see the picture with it. So I took some photos on my iPhone of, you know, uh, my girlfriend at the time, like jumping and levitating and some other like, you know, Instagram things. And I was like, here's some photos that kind of look like what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And they looked at them and they said, I, we love these ideas and we love these photos we want to hire the photographer that actually shot these and i was like yeah okay <laughs> it's it's uh, some iphone shots i took and they're like great we're gonna put a uh, canon 1dx in your hands and we're gonna have you shoot a three campaign photo shoot of these uh these runners at night doing this new reflective material that we have and we're gonna do all this stuff and i was like i don't know how to do any of that like i don't know what to charge i don't know what to do and they're like, doesn't matter. You'll be fine. Just come, you know, prepared. Tell us your lenses, your assistant, your tech, your gear, your all this. And I'm like, I don't know what, okay, I'll just show up. Mm -hmm. um, so I showed up and 
we ran through LA, had a grid permit. So not really anything blocked off. I was just like picking places. I was like, that's cool. I've barely been downtown ever, but there's some lights over there. And I think if I put them next to lights, at least I'll be able to get focus maybe while they're running. I've never shot athletes. I, I played golf and tennis in school, but I really don't watch or care about sports. So I don't know anything about that. You have me sh shooting a lifestyle sports brand. The fo photos came back and they were, some of them were in focus, like a few. And, uh, and the creative director was like, yeah, well, we have two more days. So we did a company move down to San Diego. He came down um, and I had a meeting with him 30 minutes beforehand. And I was like, he's going to fire me. He's going to call me up and he's going to say, hey, we can't have you like just messing up these. We're spending a lot of money here. You're not getting any photos that we can use. So uh, he's like, yeah, we're going to have a meeting 30 minutes beforehand. We're going to talk and then yeah, we'll see how it goes. 30 minutes come by. 15 minutes before the shoot. And I called up the producer and I'm like, hey, we're, we're supposed to have a meeting. He's like, yeah, uh, the creative director actually brought his wife down and she went into labor. So they're at the hospital now. And you're gonna have to do the shoot by yourself. Just me, you, the client and the athletes. And you're gonna have to style it and do everything. And I was like, cool. So I'm even more in the hole now. <laughs> like what is gonna happen? I've like never been to San Diego. Don't know anything about it. Um, so I, grab everybody, we go, I pick a few places and San Diego has these like light bikes and things. And like, I'm just discovering everything in San Diego at the time in downtown. And I'm just looking around, putting them there, taking photos. We come back and Nike goes, these are the, some of the best photos we've had ever shot for our campaigns in the past like 10 years. And I was like, oh, so I just had someone telling me how to be creative and having too much ah, comfort and I being, see. yeah, directed. And, that, and then I realized being somewhere new, being uncomfortable, being in the situation where it's just me and having to create something opened the door to creativity and made me just follow my voice and my vision rather than trying to fit it in someone else's box. What a formative story, how that, how that shook out. I mean, I imagine the butterfly effect of creative director showing up 30 minutes prior whatever whatever speech he was going to give and yeah. and how that would have then transpired to what actually did incredible yeah it was a it was definitely a, a very is a big leaping off point so from then basically i shot for nike for every year almost a week or two would go by and i'd have another nike campaign or someone else uh, a automotive or luxury campaign and and it just turned my whole career into traveling the world and shooting campaigns every other week on a plane. And it really changed my life for sure. What were a few of the most impactful campaigns or stops um, or, or concepts along the way? Yeah, uh, there's been so many. Uh, a few of the tourism boards, I would say, those are some of the, my favorite just because you actually get to experience the culture and the people. And a lot of times, uh, some of them are a little more curated where they have you go and do the touristy things. But places like Jordan, I visited and went to Wadi Rum and really got to explore these places and people and the Bedouins and meet, meet people that just completely different lifestyle. And it really made an impact on me, uh, floating in the Dead Sea, all these things are just amazing, but also just the culture and understanding that there are different ways of life and otherworldly almost. I mean, they shot the Martian in that desert. They shoot places that look like somewhere else, but people live there with their flock and they just walk around. They, own, they don't own any land. They just travel and it's, it's really inspiring. Um, there, India, uh, New Zealand is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been, Iceland, uh, Norway, and just, just incredible places across the world that I would go back to in a heartbeat and then new places I would still want to go. And then one of the biggest campaigns I would say that impacted me was for the World Cup when uh, Germany and Brazil ended up in the last, uh, in the World Cup. And right before that, we shot a campaign with Nike where <clears throat> we had we were traveling the world every other day. We would travel to a new place, new country, meet athletes that day, uh, learn about them, go somewhere with them wearing jerseys, soccer jerseys. The whole uh, campaign was called Pride Off the Pitch. Mm -hmm. And it's basically showing how people wear jerseys and have pride whenever, wherever they're doing their thing in the world. And so we just traveled from country to country to country every single day, all throughout Europe. And, and, and it was just incredible. We were cliff diving off the coast of Algarve in Portugal. And then we were in uh, underground in, in Paris doing uh, shooting with, you know, incredible soccer like trick 
guys. And then we would be in London uh, doing like in the London underground with BMX like kids who would do stalls on the side of the really famous red phone booths and all this cool stuff. And, and that made an impact on me realizing that just the different walks of life, meeting people from around the world and you still come away telling amazing stories just without knowing anything and also not sleeping. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine there's too much sleep with all that travel. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. Uh, there, there's a number of stories that I could tell you that didn't end up you know, going the way you thought it would, but sometimes you know, traveling around, for instance, I traveled around the islands of Norway by myself uh, before drones were even really popular and climbed a telephone uh, slash TV giant tower in the rain. Dumbest thing I've ever done probably, or one <laughs> of them besides standing on the edge of uh, Prike Stolen, which I have photos of me at the very edge, trying to take a selfie, like setting up my tripod on the other side of a rock with it like teetering off the edge. And then me going and standing like, the, the rock goes out. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but the rock is like, like this. And at the <laughs> very tip, it goes like that. So you're standing right there on the tip and there's like, there's just nothing. Um, I'm not a heights guy. I'm not a heights guy. So you're freaking me out. <laughs> yeah, don't do it. Don't do it. Uh, there's been a lot of cliffs and things I've stood on that I would not recommend. But um, there's something about just the thrill and the adrenaline that you chase. So this stretch of time with endless opportunities, campaigns, travel, exploration, how would you describe the relationship with what you're doing professionally with your personal art? Would you make a distinction between the two and, and how do they evolve together? Yeah, so I would say my Instagram has really been a journal, photo journal of my time traveling. It wasn't always, I rarely, rarely, rarely posted my commercial work. So I'd be shooting a campaign for Alfa Romeo somewhere in Joshua Tree or somewhere in the world. And then I wouldn't share any of those photos. Um, and then I'd do that for Jeep or whoever else or, or, uh, or Microsoft. And none of that stuff would go publicly facing. It would just be something I would shoot, but then I'd turn around and I'd take a photo of like the beautiful sunset or something that was going on. And for me, that was tying my personal work to this is, I picked this time of day, I picked this location, I picked all of the things that go here, but I just didn't put the product in it because this was my personal photo journal of, this is me, this is my, my moment. I, I'm just bringing, and it's like a, it's me combined collaborating with this brand. It's always been my personal brand collaborating. It hasn't ever been just uh, their vision or anything else, especially after that first kind of interaction and understanding that it really has to come from you as an artist. So when I do that and I show these places, uh, I can go back and I can look at every single one of those photos as a memory, realize what happened then, what I ate that day, what, who I was around and why that was there. And then talk about the fact that I was shooting a campaign while I was there. Uh, it was completely separate. What's one or two of just memorable, I'm sure there are a lot of favorites, but memorable moments of a personal photo journal capture when you were doing something else, you turned around, you had that sunset moment. Uh, yeah, what are a few of those? Yeah, um, boy, that's, I almost have to go scroll through my feed. It's like I've <laughs> offloaded the memories onto those photos and been like, I don't have to remember that here because I can see it. And that's something that I think photography has really given us also. Uh, is that we can offload these beautiful moments and then go back and be like, here's one. Okay. So I was in, <clears throat> I was shooting a campaign for a client. I can't even, I still to this day can't even talk about it. Um, but it was a campaign where I went to Kauai and I was at the, I was just traveling and walking along the beaches, taking photos. And uh, at the very end of it, end, end of one of the beaches, there was just the most beautiful sunset I've ever seen. And I took a photo of it and shared it. And I was like, I really want to talk about this campaign because it's really cool, but I can't. And it's so beautiful. And then the next day we went around the Nepali coast and they weren't doing boat tours because the waves were so high that time of year. And so we got in this little dinghy and it was like no, you know, no more than four or five people could fit in it. And it would just go above. It would go on these waves and it would go on the wave and then be in the air for like three seconds and then fall and smash down on the other side. And it was a two hour trip doing that up and smash for two hours while we were going to this cave that I wanted to check out because it happened to have like this really cool splash or whatever. And I don't know why, you know, we do the things we do, but, and while we were going there, I started feeling horribly seasick. Like 
I could not keep my eyes that'll, open. That'll do it. <laughs> yeah, it was it was bad. And I was passing out in the boat and I wrapped my hand around one of the ropes so that I wouldn't fall out in case I passed out. And I was like falling asleep and just from like all of this exhaustion. And then the sea, for some reason, right where we were, started to calm down. And then all of a sudden, these giant whales came and just came right in our vision and started breaching and jumping and these little baby whales with them. And they started jumping and blowing and their tails and everything. And I had my camera in my hand and I was so out of it that I couldn't take a photo. And it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my entire life. And I was just sitting there enjoying it and thinking this. And then I saw this, you know, the, the movie years later with, uh, Ben Stiller with like the snow leopard and all this other stuff. Right. I don't know if you've seen that movie. Um, but he's like, I just saw it and I didn't even want to take a picture. That's how it felt in that moment. Truly. I just saw this amazing Nat Geo quality photo happening and I'm just, I couldn't do anything about it. <laughs> it was and, and it's now stuck in your mind, whereas all the other photos are cataloged. And so Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. that's so true. Yeah, yeah. Funny how that works. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it's, it's been, there's a lot of special moments and special people and have been there around the world. I have a friend in Germany who has had hiccups for 30 years and he's an amazing photographer and, uh, and composer. And we, you know, slept in a car traveling around Germany. He showed me a bunch of places and I'll never forget that road trip because we were just sleeping in a car, two grown men while he's hiccuping and I can't sleep and <laughs> waking up to the most beautiful uh, Milky Way over these German landscapes. And, and there's just times like that, that you'll, you'll never forget. Quick detour hiccups for 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's had hiccups uh, and he's had, he can't get rid of them every like 10, 15 minutes. He'll hiccup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. He's, okay. he's an amazing photographer too. Like uh, he's really, really, really cool guy. Um, but yeah, he just will, if you had a call with him, he'd be hiccuping. <laughs> medical marvel yeah it's amazing all right to so walk us a little bit further down the road of your personal artwork and uh an inch us closer to this this nft space and what's the secure i'm sure the path is circuitous it has to be because you're going all over the world um but yeah get us get us closer to that moment yeah so uh a lot of it has to do with uh you know the pandemic and the timing of course mm -hmm. all of that stuff happening uh i as a travel photographer who gets inspiration by traveling and being somewhere new, this last year has been really difficult, both uh, for mental health and also for the amount of jobs that I've gotten because the people that I would normally get jobs from want me to travel and I can't. So all of those things kind of came to a head uh, early on and I realized, I kind of saw it happening. I'd just gone to India with my family, uh, my girlfriend and visited my dad and his family with it was really special because I brought all film and I came back and I was like, I can't wait to show these. And it just, it really became this draining kind of thing where I, I haven't don't, I haven't even really shared many of those photos yet because of how just this world, I was, I was almost like, I'm putting this on pause. I'm putting my identity, who I am on pause for however long this takes. And uh, so I started investing my time in picking up. I, I mean, I, played music a little bit when I was younger, was in a jazz band and some other things, but really hadn't done anything for a long time. So I was hanging out with, uh, you know, Jose Silva and Dave and some other people. We were just playing like Call of Duty together just to hang out, you know, playing video games during a pandemic with your friends, just to talk and have, you know, time to have social interaction. And that's what we did almost every day. We would play games and then I would go and I'd make music and um, do things like that. And just had to be creative, but also social in some way in the new normal. And then we led to where I was starting to realize there's a lot of opportunity in, in this uh, world of digital, purely digital world. And Jose has been in crypto for a long time. And he brought me in and said, hey, you got to check this out. And then our friend Phil as well. He was in, the, um, you know, basically the whole Animus crew. And we started looking into more of this and I was just getting introduced to crypto, even though we were just playing games. I ended up being like top 25 in the world in a video game called Apex, <laughs> this is Battle Royale. And I was just so into like being the best at something. And I was like, I'm gonna just do this. And then I was like, you know what, let's, let's change path back to being creative and figure out a way to do this. And, um, and we started delving into that, developing uh, work in a creative way 
and I wasn't really still focused on photography. So at the beginning of the year, I started working, uh, just learning 3D. And I was like, this is really cool. I can do photography. I can build lights and build textures and environments and landscapes. And I could do my imagination that I have wishing I was somewhere else. I could do it here on the computer and build it digitally, bring all of these learnings I've had as a filmmaker, as a photographer, and do it in a way that I wish I would have picked this up years ago because it's so fulfilling. Um, so within a few months, I just started making stuff, sharing stuff, minting things on, on OpenSea just to see what would happen because I don't, I don't have the background that everybody else does of uh, a fine arts career or anything. I have a commercial career mostly. Um, I've never really sold prints. People can't, like they've asked for prints for years and I've just, I know that my price range of doing a, a commercial shoot is just not like, why do prints? Uh, and I would rather just gift them to people. So mm -hmm. I've only gifted really um, and not asked for money because I just think there's, there's, the, there's been a discrepancy between the two worlds of fine art collectors and commercial brands and they have budgets and and it goes towards something that i know will end up getting them more money back and i have this you know relationship where i know the value is the piece of work itself when it comes to collection and uh fine art world mm -hmm. so it's, it's a little bit of a difference and so i started developing and learning 3d and building these landscapes and i started in unreal because i could actually like explore them walk around and i was like this is cool i can just build the landscape that i want to shoot and i can have a drone flying around and do whatever i want and and that's that's really cool and I'm, i've been developing you know diving back into that now uh because of that kind of same mindset then i picked up some other 3d programs and started doing portraiture with mm -hmm. 3d because i wanted to showcase that's another facet of what i do is I work with people, but I can't go shoot with people right now when there's a pandemic going on. So uh, I create these 3D models and I dress them and light them and do these things and um, ended up finding a lot of great collectors that loved the work. And I was like, there's potential success here for someone who doesn't necessarily have the huge background in the technical skill of 3D, but I have a lot of the aesthetic skill coming from photography and knowing how light works and I can bring those together. It's just a matter of time until I can really fully develop and the technology gets out of the way and I can just create from my imagination. Talk us through when you go to OpenSea and let's see, you have, let's see, no pun intended. You have uh, eight artworks up there currently, but take us through the first one. What's the decision-making process behind, I am going to mint something and here's where it's gonna go and here's what that artwork is going to be. Yeah, so the very first thing I minted, I think it's still up there um, and it's one of those that is not my best work, but it's something that I minted because it was the world I was building in Unreal. And I, it was kind of, I, I, I put a monolith in my world and I was like, I just want to have something you can discover. And I want to create a world around that. And I'm always about world building and storytelling. And something I've been working on is something called Tempest, which is a large scale world building story that I'm developing my NFTs and pieces of art that how is a little piece of it that I want people to be able to collect. And then when they see the full thing unveiled, they know that they own a piece of it. So in my mind, I was building the landscape and the worlds within this story. And I'm exploring it like a Neil Gaiman or a Stephen King or someone who's building this huge universe and trying to tell the story. But sometimes there's little mini stories within it that people can feel like they're part of it. And then when it all comes together, it's like the Avengers and the Marvel universe when it explodes into this overarching, um, amazing story. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where I started my journey and it's still going there. And all of the pieces that I'm making kind of still have this, this thread that comes back to me as the artist. And, and again, if you look into like Stephen King's work, uh, you can see that there's there's a central point or Neil Gaiman with the Sandman, things like that. There's a, there's a central point of theoretical or philosophical how you view the world. And then there's all these offshoots of stories that are magical and different and, and unique. And that's where my work comes from and how it ties back is going to be revealed over time. And that first mint, I was, I was talking to Phil and Jose and I was like, should I mint something? Should I wait? It's like the big drop thing. I need to market it, do all that. Uh, and they're like, it, at the beginning, we didn't know, we were still figuring it out. Um, they were like, just put stuff up there, let the market decide. I was like, okay, well, I've got these ideas. I'm building these worlds. I'm doing this stuff. I think it's cool. Put it out there um, and let let it ride and see what happens. And not doing photography yet because I wanted to keep that a little bit special since it has such a long story and history in my own journey. Um, 
And so there's like these two worlds of, I can build these worlds in 3D, still from the same artist, put my own music. I even started composing my own music for all my pieces. So you can see on OpenSea and my foundation, um, all of these pieces that have original music because that's still something, a part of me in the pandemic that I was working on that I want to include. So there's a really big intersection of all of the arts. And to me, it's about almost like filmmaking when there's a collaboration of different kinds of arts that we see, music, sound design, acting, performance, 3D visual effects all together to tell one cohesive story. What was the reaction like on OpenSea? On OpenSea, uh, at first, I think it was a little bit of crickets because nobody understood that a photographer was doing 3D, but only on the collection side. On the other side, I was getting DMs every single day and in my private chats and everything being like, so how long have you been doing 3D? Like a couple of years? And I was like, no, I picked it up a month ago or two months ago or, or a week ago, whatever it is the time. I was just figuring it out. And people were like, this is like, you're going to be huge in the 3D space if you keep doing this. That's actually, be I had somebody from uh, one of the big brands that wanted to partner with me. They're like, we've followed your work, your photography forever. And we think that you're going to make the biggest impact with your 3D and visual effects work. Uh, it's going to be like, the thing that people remember you for. And Whoa. I was like, that's, that's huge because I'm still learning. I feel like a baby. I feel, I'm a neophyte learning. And for you to say that, I was, I was very, very blown away. So I'm, again, I, I feel like I'm still learning and I'm just scratching the surface, but um, I was getting a lot of positive feedback on my 3D because I think people were connecting the dots of the, the storytelling. And I think that's hopefully what I can continue with it. And what do your days look like at that point when you're getting this positive feedback loop and thinking, I have so much to learn. I mean, how many hours a day are you spending in 3D programs? Way too many. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not like sleeping at all. My girlfriend's like trying to spend time with me and I'm just like, folk, like completely Think, thinking about 3D constantly. I wake up with ideas and I'm like, oh, that's what I need to do. And I, you know, rush to the computer and make sure my render is done so I can start and yeah, it, it, it definitely is consuming. I, I started learning everything too. I, I, I'm kind of a, I'm a little obsessive probably because I want to learn everything that I find passion in. So I started learning Houdini, Cinema 4D, Blender, um, every little program from there that, that would work with it, Unreal, uh, and, and trying to just do everything all at once, all while also being a creative director for a company and uh, on the side during the pandemic, they hit me up. I directed a commercial. I did a shoot for Microsoft. Uh, so I was planning for those. And then I also started doing uh, like designing medical devices for this company and working on developing AI techniques. Like I I'm just an obsessive learner and I love to do new things. I don't know. You, you just went, you went and threw two curveballs at the end of that. You're like designing medical devices. Yeah. <laughs> so Ruby does everything. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how I got uh, into the designing medical devices range, but um, yeah, I'm working with a company and uh, they saw my 3D work and they were like, we were paying a lot of money for this other person to do it. And we were figuring this out and we see that you could do 3D and do you want to try it? And I, I did a couple of concepts and they were like, okay, they're fired. You're hired. <laughs> it just, and now I do it as like designing concept cars. It's pretty fun. Amazing. Yeah. And you get to use 3D tools. So yeah, exactly. So it's, and I think that there's something to learn there that is that people like to silo art and artists. They like to say, oh, uh, I think that you're this kind of artist or photographer. You're a portrait artist. You're a landscape photographer. You're this. For some reason, humans, we like to be able to categorize people. Mm -hmm. Music too. You're an EDM only. You only do this. I don't know why that's easier, but it is. And it's detrimental, I think, to a lot of artists and humans to try to pigeonhole themselves because you'll find a lot more success if you do one thing very well, mm -hmm. uh, then you do a lot of things and people will try to like follow those strings and figure out what you're going to do next. And, uh, and there's something that's, this is a, that's a very long conversation. I would love to have with you figuring that out and, and delving into it. But uh, yeah, I think that for me, I'm just, I love the idea of being a Renaissance person and mm -hmm. chasing whatever passion I have and, and, It'll be a, like a collaborative way of using different resources and different inputs and seeing what the end result will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. And maybe, well, yeah, you know, again, we can have this conversation, uh, may maybe another, I don't know, fireside chat or something, but yeah. 
yeah, the, the lenses that we look at things through. And yeah, I think humans in general typically crave structure, which applies to how we view a lot of things, in, including artists in this case. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting to look through the lens of commercial success or what is, you know, typically that is a stylistic choice, some semblance of consistency uh, for a prolonged period of time, which sets expectations. Which, but then there is also, there are other cases. There are other, there are outlier situations. There are these macro Renaissance men or women who do explore a lot of different things and find success in multiple pathways, sometimes bringing those pathways together ultimately in the future. So again, maybe out of scope for today, but it's a, it's a fun topic. Totally. And I think that's, I always encourage, I, I've had a lot of photographers in the space come to me, you know, being uh, kind of a pro prolific like community builder on Instagram early on in the days of, of Instagram when Instameets would happen, all that stuff. Uh, to now when in the NFT space, people are looking for community and understanding and resources. And they're, I've talked to a lot of photographers that come in and say, you know, again, like we were talking at the very beginning, the trajectory of photography, they were going, oh, I have to learn 3D. I have to learn After Effects. I have to like do something completely different than what I know and, and can do to, can I just mint my photography? And to me, I always kind of looked at it like do whatever you feel is right as an artist. And then if you do end up learning After Effects, end up learning 3D, whatever, you'll just have more skills and more insight into the world and what you can do creatively to then mint or do whatever, or take that and light your next shoot differently because you know how to position lights in 3D and it gives you a new perspective. Um, all that stuff is just, it's additive. There's no, no negative uh, like time waste. I think everybody thinks that there's like, spend 10,000 hours and like, that's always a misquote, right? Spend 10,000 hours in one direction and you'll be an expert. A lot of times to me, it's a squiggly line to success. Mm -hmm. It's go all over the place. You'll find stuff, bounce around like a ping pong. And eventually you're going to find something that all of those things were pointing to in the macro scale and you'll, you'll find success. Yeah. And also how many 10,000 hour journeys burn out along the way without totally. that, without a little bit of diversity, you know, at least a little bit, just a touch. Yeah. Yeah. You'll, you'll feel more fulfilled. Like you can do the same thing a lot and you'll find potential success financially, or you can find uh, success internally if you mm -hmm. do a lot of things that you find you're passionate about. So take us over to foundation. How does that come around? How do you diversify from OpenSea? Yeah. So foundation uh, was, was one of those things where I was going from, I know that I can do one thing and I'm learning one thing to, I'm going to create something and then find a voice here. And I put that first piece up, which I, you know, modeled this skull and, and did this procedural generation in Houdini, which to me was like, I did something, I, I, I'm a wizard. I know a little bit of Houdini. <laughs> like, that's how that program makes me feel. Uh, and then I animated it and did this thing. And I was like, if it doesn't sell like the ones on OpenSea, that's fine. At least I'm you know, putting it out there. It got featured on the front page at the top. I got bids like from multiple people immediately. And I was like, okay, there's something here. Uh, I'm... And that's, and that's self-preservation, right? On foundation. Exactly. Yep. And all of my pieces, I, you know, even in my captions on Instagram, a lot of times I, I was, I was a copywriter, right? So there's always like double entendres and, and meanings within them. Uh, so that one was very much like, how do I, are we establishing a digital age where we create ourselves and what part of ourselves will we take into this digital age? Um, are we going to be anonymous? Are we going to be our true authentic selves? Whatever. That was kind of my exploration there with that piece. So um, as we, this veil kind of moves around and, and covers parts and reveals parts and is it technology? Is it, is it, it's a human skull. So it's, it's still organic. Um, we have other people trying to kind of, these hands are coming out and, and they're, you know, are they controlling us? Are they, you know, reaching out for, you know, something from us? Are they giving to us? Uh, there's a lot of, you know, meaning in there, at least there was to me. And, uh, and it just kind of led me down this path of, I'm going to start creating more human elements and portraiture, which isn't always the thing that people know me for too. They think I'm a landscape photographer or whatever, but I've shot for Nike and all these other brands where I'm only shooting people um, for so long. So then I did a series of portraits where I had uh, these four muses and I did that as my first drop. And most people on foundation were just doing one at a time uh, auctions, et cetera. And I was like, I'm going to do a drop. I don't have a nifty gateway drop. I don't have, you know, something huge set up yet. 
but I'm going to do this and see how it goes. And I put them up and told the story in clubhouse and they just, so many people came in and wanted to know about them. And I was telling the story about how they were reflections of myself during the pandemic, where you have this kind of uncertainty during the, you know, who you are, identity, all these things that kind of were uh, this, one of them's the garden of thoughts uh, has, you know, this, uh, all these plants coming out and it's like, you have so many thoughts and what, what do you do with all of them? Sometimes it can be overwhelming. You don't feel, you know, like yourself and, you know, somebody related with that. So many people related to those pieces and they took them and, and made them part of themselves. And I got bids very quickly on those as well. And I realized that there's something there beyond, you know, the world we're in now with uh, profile pictures and avatars, but there's identity to portraits. And that's mm -hmm. often what we see in portrait photography as well is that we see a part of ourselves or another human that is doing something different than us. And it's a self-reflection in art. It's often a mirror more than it is a lens. And that's what I was delving into. And I started to realize between that and my stories with Tempest, uh, I wanted to storytell on a larger scale and then bring some mirrors and identity through my work. You touched on Probably my favorite, well, definitely my favorite of the four, but the Garden of Thoughts piece is, yeah, it's spectacular, both in, in color and composition. There's a lot going on there, uh, but it's a, it's a joy to look at. Thank you. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I just loved making those pieces. Um, yeah, and I, I like that, that makes me so happy to hear that you love that one because that's, uh, yeah, really special to me. I just encourage, I, th there are so many levels to it which it, it both look first glance, it looks simple. I would encourage anyone to, uh, I can link it in show notes and everything, but I would encourage everyone on foundation to go find it. It has this beautiful green. It looks simple at first glance. Then all of a sudden you realize it's extremely complex. I, I like that there's a solid color that's um, like ar around the face. And then you have the, the, tr the three circles set and then lines emanating from there, which I don't know, it gives the background this texture. I don't know, there's a lot. Anyway, I would encourage everyone to go go draw your own conclusions, but it's an, an amazing piece of artwork to look at. Thank you, yeah, the the descriptions in there, I think um, I wrote a little, a couple lines of poetry for each one. Uh, I would definitely, I know a lot of times we just look at the visuals, but the descriptions sometimes can combine things too. And, and I think that it's, yeah, I love hearing that from you and hearing kind of what you uh, 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 see in it hearing me stumble over my words real time, trying to <laughs> convey what I'm feeling. Yeah. <laughs> Feelings are hard. <laughs> the they translation are. between feeling and words <laughs> is, yeah. is difficult. All right. So take us past that. That's so that's your first self orchestrated drop on foundation. Yeah. And then, and it meets incredible success and, and, and people are interested in bidding. And like you said, they go quick and what's, what's next, where do you go from there? Yeah. So that was, that was also at the height, I think of the NFT kind of and, and, and ETH all times highs and everything. So, you know, looking at pieces that are going for something like three ETH at the time times 4,500 ish, you know? So to me, that was like, Oh, this is a big like deal. And I think from there, I started realizing a little bit like there's some imposter syndrome that comes up when you realize I've entered in the world of fine art, I'm having success and I love it. I'm just learning still. I'm bringing all my stuff over. And then I have so many people saying, oh, we really want to see photography and everything. And I'm like, so I'm in two, two minds right now. Where Should I mint photography? Should I keep going with 3D? What should I do? Uh, and then I realized like, I'm just going to keep making art the way I want to make art. And I'm going to do both. And I'm going to, you know, at that point, I got so many people hitting me up to do collaborations that half of my work is literally, I can't even re reveal it. And it still hasn't even released yet because okay. I'm doing these huge pieces and collaborating with someone that's gonna end up releasing it later on. So I took a little bit more of a community uh, role, like leading people to the space, informing resources, that kind of stuff. Um, but now I'm starting to do more and more uh, pieces and kind of dropping things, little teasers on Twitter as I, as I work on them uh, and, and releasing them and I've got another piece that went out and then I was like, I'm gonna do photography as well. So mm -hmm. I put out a piece of photography uh, and just a few hours after I put it out, uh, it got a bid as well as my one 3D piece that hadn't gotten a bid yet, uh, which was called Mediterra, which kind of was starting to allude to the fact that I was integrating 
photography without telling people because it was a portrait within a landscape from an aerial mm -hmm. aerial drone view uh, and then led to the photography that came out and they both got a bid from the uh, same collector on the same day so to me that was a huge validation point of i can do both and even the same collector sees value in both is it elements of nature that came first elements of nature was the very first my very first photo minted on the blockchain how do you make that decision out of that vast, vast personal library? That is a very hard question, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> um, making the decision to, to do that, I think there was a lot in that piece. I was on a solo journey driving around uh, through Italy, Austria, Germany, um, through mountain ranges by myself for, for a while, taking photos, being out in places that I didn't know if I was safe or not, um, taking photos of at night and this also like i lived at the end of a road when i first my origin story um i lived on a, a dead end and at the end of the ro my road there's a lake a very tiny lake where we grew up i grew up uh ice skating and other things but you really couldn't swim in it so you just kind of stood because it was like just kind of uh a dirty lake i guess but not really dirty but just like mucky um and you couldn't really swim in it so you kind of just could stand in it and you could look but you couldn't really be there and this photo is actually at the edge of a lake with a forest and it just had a little bit reminded me a little bit of my childhood and also had this kind of ethereal nature of the stars that you see um, the clouds that parted just at the right moment and I was all alone and it was just this quiet I could hear you know the, the sounds of nature and to me that was kind of like here's a jumping off point of who I am where I came from but also where I've I've gotten to and how I know that the journey and, and the future is, is just beginning again. And that's kind of what it felt like for me is like a chapter of I I'm at my childhood kind of view, but in a new place. I like that story of personal connection a lot, tying it back to a childhood memory and something that was, yeah, representative of, of where you grew up. Um, a, a strange note about that photo is that when I first glance at it, the crop of trees or the forest it when the photo is small like in other words when i'm browsing the thumbnails on my computer it looks like a cliff mm. they're, they're they're so tight together it just looks like this jagged cliff that you could stand on and, and fall off so i maybe i'm just thinking back to your stories about <laughs> standing on cliffs <laughs> yeah i have to show you some photos that will make you feel uncomfortable if you want <laughs> i'll send you some <laughs> photos of there's the photo of me standing on the cliff then there's always the photo that i take looking down like Mm -hmm. from that perspective that even I still get like a little hairs on the back of my neck raised. <laughs> um, yeah. um, my wife, we jokingly say uh, she is danger girl and I'm her ground bound sidekick. And we've been to the Grand Canyon before and I've uh, shot her doing handstands. She was a gymnast way closer to an edge than I would like to, you know, it's where I'm way, I'm, I'm completely safe. I'm far away from the edge but she's so close that I almost feel like I'm falling over. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. I love it. Yeah. That's uh, definitely some risk takers out there. I want to see some of those photos too. Cause all right, we'll trade. We'll yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't do a handstand because I don't trust my, you know, <laughs> my balance that much, but I, I think that's impressive for sure. Yeah. Agreed. And, and terrifying, but yeah. <laughs> all right. So we go from elements of nature to perfect storm, um, rays of hope and pastel dreams. So, anywhere you want to go in there. Yeah. So these are bringing, basically that opened the door, that first photo opened the door to, I want to explore and share some of the photos that uh, from around the world, explaining my story of who I am, where I go. Um, each one of those has a really deep, meaningful story behind it. But I think that sometimes the photo, uh, you know, in this world where we look at the visual, we need to be drawn in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll, do a quick pass of each one, but mm -hmm. basically, um, you know, the one of them is in Belize, and this this the place we were at, the Key Cocker, uh, is known for Belize is known because of some of the the uh, natural kind of disasters that happen, take out half of the ocean or take out half of the beach or the island, um, and so when you're surrounded in a place that is known for that kind of danger, and then you see the storm come in and these lightning bolts come down. Um, to me, I was just, you can't do anything about it. You're there. Like you can run, you could do whatever, 
but you're just in the middle of it and kind of hearkening to how much we are vulnerable as a species in this world that we take for granted a lot of times is that, you know, mother nature is, is a huge force. So that to me was, I was sitting there on the beach looking out and the storm was coming in and these lightning bolts, just huge lightning bolts all around the 360. Just, I, I was like, I'm taking a photo of this because that's all I can do is I can be surrounded by this and I can capture this moment or I can have fear and that will lead to nothing but more fear. So I took a photo of it and not a few hours later, that storm completely cleared and it was a Milky Way, bright as you can see. The entire like little city had browned out. So there was no lights coming from it at, at one point and it was just magical. And just knowing that those two things can coexist was really special. And I, I felt like this captured that tiny little hut with a little light on, you know, that's the, the strength that humans have against the massive mother nature coming in with, you know, just the most power you've ever seen. Yeah. So yeah. makes us, makes us all feel small from time to time, but I don't know how many of us have experienced the, the breadth of situations that you have. Yeah. That's the, that's the beauty is that you never know across the world what other people could be experiencing at that time. You're right. Yeah. You're right. I have one moment that stacks up to your thousand and it was climbing Mount Fuji at midnight and watching the sun break from above the clouds. Like that's, that's all I've got, Ravi. It's all I've got. <laughs> that's my <Amazing>. moment. <laughs> I love it. I love it because you're in a place that, I mean, that's the thing too. It's like Everest is cool. You can climb it, but you're also surrounded by amazing, like huge mountains also. So it doesn't look that impressive. Fuji is like by itself. Right. And that's why it looks so impressive. So I bet you had an amazing, amazing view. It was un unbelievable. We'll never forget it, but you're, you're also making me jealous. Seeing this wide range of landscapes, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's an incredible breadth of experience. I'm very lucky. Like, uh, I'm, I mean, between that and then, um, I think Pastel Dreams is one that I think is very special because of how remote that place is. And I've always wanted to go to Africa and I've always wanted to, you know, uh, see different places that are just so foreign to mm -hmm. me. And I was lucky enough to go with a wildlife conservation company and they invited me to go and see the wildlife as well as help with uh, some of the medical facilities they were building in schools uh, for some of the locals who didn't have the resources. And they were putting their money toward that and building these amazing places that, you know, women have to walk for so many miles when they're pregnant to give birth if they want to go to like a medical facility and they're trying to build them closer so that they don't have to do that or any sort of medicine and things. It's just it's just a completely different world. And seeing that in person, I was just really moved and, and touched by all the things and, and trying to showcase the places so that I think the thing that I have and a lot of photographers have that we can do is we can showcase beautiful places to drive people to go visit them, to experience mm -hmm. them for themselves so that they can get the actual interaction and come away with the experiences that make them want to help people that they don't know and don't ever meet. And the more that we can kind of drive people to be tourists or at least experience other places and other walks of life, the more open-minded and the more and the less tribal we become and the more engaged in the human race as a whole. And that's important to me. And if I can showcase that by showcasing really incredible places across the world like this, this is a, a pink lake with just this mud bottom that you have to like travel and not fall with all this camera gear that I had, uh, you know, traveling across for miles basically and seeing this tiny flock of the flamingos that were left and just in the dark, complete darkness. And I see these little like silhouettes in the distance and then the sun just barely starts to peek up and just pink rays and the entire world around me became pink, including the reflection from the water and the flamingos. And I was like, this is unbelievable. How many people get to experience an entire world that is pink in real life? And the fact that that's happening somewhere and I just happened to be there, uh, it just blew my mind. And I, was, I had to take a photo and, and, uh, and we had actually gone, that was the second time we'd gone because the first time the flamingos weren't there. We went too late in the day. We traveled across this covered in mud. It was just, and it's really apparently it's super toxic water. So it, not necessarily something that everyone should do, but, um, or at least more than once but when we did it's just to me that moment and that place became so remote that very few people will ever go there mm -hmm. there's there's actual footprints from early man in nearby there 
uh, that are preserved and they have like, it, it, it's like a rope around it barely. And these are some pl- like things that people would s- will go to museums to see. Mm-hmm. And it's just so far away from everything that they don't need to because nobody's going to mess with it. Cause they're going to see that tiny rope and be like, what's that? They're going to see the sign and realize those are early man. Some of the earliest humans ever to work, walk on earth are preserved in that mud because nobody ever goes there and it's been like locked away. Um, so yeah, to me, that's, that's an amazing place that the percentage of people that will ever see that in real life is mm-hmm. so small that it became a really important photo to me to release and, uh, and to showcase. Yeah. It's just, it, it doesn't look real. And yeah. the fact that it is, I mean, that it tells the whole story. It will tell a part of the story right there. Just, uh, yeah. The ability to take a real photo, have it look fake, but then talk about walking to there, capturing it just at the perfect moment. Um, I don't know that, that resonates with me. I also, um, I realized that anything, anything, that is flamingo related. I look at as a subtle tip to Gavin Shapiro because he's so yeah. <laughs> still flamingo. He's still flamingo. flamingo yeah, he com- I think he commented on it, and I was like, "Yes, Gavin saw it. That's a win just to have him see it." Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ravi, want to play a game? Let's do it. All right, lightning round time. Okay. All right. Rules are simple. There are no real rules, but a couple words, a sentence, a couple sentences. However. If I touch on something and you want to expand and go off on a tangent, you have more than the more than the freedom to call time out, say anything you need to say, and then we can always circle back to it. Let me get a drink of coffee here. <laughs> okay, so a couple. I'll, I'll try to keep it super short. You've shown some restraint, by the way. I think that's the first time you pick up your coffee. All all origin story. Yeah, no, I'm. Uh, you know, I've had more than enough of it this morning. So. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> all right. Lightning round. Topic number one, NFTs. The future. Ethereum. Uh, Utility. Photography. Um, That one's so hard. (laughs) Uh, I think I want to say art. Love it. Open sea overwhelming at times but i think it's a uh, it's a beautiful thing to be able to have the, the the chance to be overwhelmed by so much foundation um curated not even curated it's like uh really it's like the it's it's like um hmm. fine art punk uh-huh uh-huh made by animus inspiring jay and silva a homie i think i think he's like one of the people that has always from the beginning of Instagram, like when I look at, I looked back at DMs from forever ago before we even met. And he's just like, Hey man, love your photography, blah, blah, blah. And then I, you know, he tells me about being inspired by looking at my photos. And I just, it's like someone that I didn't know would be, become one of my friends for life. And I just didn't know it. And that's, I think people like Silva have really helped me as someone who's an only child, grew up in the middle of nowhere, and realize that you can make a friend across this internet thing who has similar interests to you or wants to bring you into the fold of their friends and things. And has just really been a gatherer in that way. And I think, yeah, the homey friend uh, feeling of being able to do that for a lifetime with somebody you have never met before, but we're destined to meet. Dave Krugman. Same, same. Similar, like there, this is like, the small group, I have a photo of them that I posted on Facebook that I took when I first met them, uh, the winter walk in NYC, where I was in a hotel at the W looking down at a group of people and I didn't know who they were. And I looked at Instagram and realized that was an Insta meet that they were hosting. And then I looked down and I said, huh. Wow. And I walked, I was shooting for Nike in, in New York, just happened to be there, went down to the park, went over, just started walking around, looking around, trying to find them. People started whispering and being like, is that Ravi? Is that Ravi Vora? Like they knew me, but I had never met them or 
mm-hmm. or anything. And then I met Silva and Dave the same day. And we walked around New York. They took portraits of me. And then I took a picture of them all together. And it was like becoming, that was, that was the origin story of us for sure. Because we met that day and Dave, who I didn't know at all, Silva, I didn't know at all. But then just based on the DMs we had, knew that we would connect. And we ended up just like becoming, yeah, lifelong friends. What a coincidence. The, fo- the aerial photo that start- started it all in real life. Yeah, actually insane. Then Dave went in a a Barnes and Noble or something and was shooting a picture of out from the window of this whole group of people. And we all were standing there and I was like, oh, this, if I, you know, if I ever find that photo, this is the moment when we were all there. And we just went on a road trip for AT&T, just the three of us in a car driving down the coast from Seattle all the way down to Las Vegas. Uh, And we just bonded over a legendary journey shooting with our iPhones and and man, there's just so many stories of Silva and Dave and I and and what we've gone through together, <laughs> legal and illegal <laughs> photos we've taken of uh, going places. And, you know, it was legal, we thought, but who knows? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know. You didn't know. Yeah, we didn't know. <laughs> At the drop of a hat, there's no restrictions. Everything is completely back to normal in the world. And at this very moment, you have the ability to transport anywhere with no difficulty of travel right now by yourself where do you go anywhere in the world Oof. probably iceland iceland yeah i want to go to iceland and i also want to teleport all of my friends <laughs> there too if i could if i had the power i would i just want to do and i want i really want to do an nft photography slash creative meetup mm-hmm. and i want to do it somewhere beautiful like iceland where we're just hanging out and taking photos and talking and eating good food and just being like, yeah, like Miami, but somewhere that is full of amazing landscapes. Same question, different purpose. Drop of a hat, no difficulty of travel. Where do you go if in five minutes you had to come up with a concept for your next NFT and shoot it on the spot? So it needs to be somewhere you think might be photo ready and up to the challenge. Okay, it's uh, summer and I think we're going to Patagonia. Nice. Yeah, we're going to Patagonia. Nice. Our summer is their winter. It's incredible. Just like, also I have to be able to survive because I'm teleporting. So if it's freezing cold when I get there. True. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Patagonia for sure. Chronologically, so don't worry about rankings. Chronologically, the last piece of NFT related digital art that made your jaw drop? Oh, man. Made my jaw drop. I go through so many every single day that I'm just like, my jaw doesn't come up from the floor. <laughs> <I'm just> like, <laughs> so many talented artists out there. It's insane. Oh, you know who, who really impressed me? Just because I think the technical talent level is insane is, uh, I think it's, Oof, I don't want to get the name wrong. Give me one second. Yeah, yeah. Um, I believe this is, I, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but yeah, Adam Swab. Um, Adam Swab and I think Rafiq Enadal, mm. Jesse uh, Wolston, all these people that do incredible Houdini work that analyze and use data to drive uh, things. To me, that really speaks a lot because I think for me using Houdini and, and, and integrating data from our real world in, in some way, whether it's sound or color, um, and then recreating it in a way that we can reimagine it is really impressive to me. Whether that fits within my world of like what people think of me as an artist, it is something I want to do more of. And you saw it in Miami. Um, mm-hmm. That was a lot of that was actually Houdini work, trying to develop ways that we could take something and then morph it and change it based on using um, math or equations or wavelengths, whatever it was that were actually, and I'm also doing that driving uh, visuals that are driven from the data from my photographs. So I'm actually using color and, and light and driving that. A lot of people use old artworks and things from you know the Renaissance painters. And I wanted to do it with the work that I've created because that does you know two things. It brings my photography and my more analog look at the world. Mm-hmm and then translates it into a digital reimagination. 
And your work is so global. So that's fascinating. Just yeah. making a, like a melting pot of, of your global photographs. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited about it. And that was impressive, by the way, just to touch on that for a moment at the, the animus party in Miami, the fact that you're, the artwork that you created was just on this massive, uh, massive screen behind the band that was playing music. Uh, pretty, pretty special showcase. That was, yeah, that's the biggest I've ever seen in my work. I mean, I've, I've had billboards and things, but having like moving work mm -hmm. that size. Uh, yeah, that was, that was really cool to see. Um, I was like, yeah, thank you for saying that because it just made my, made my entire night just seeing that and seeing everybody kind of gather around it and, yep. and then make it part of their photos of the night. You know, they were taking selfies in front of it and things. And I was, yeah, that, that made it even more special knowing that it connected with people. For sure. That question phrased a little bit differently. The last piece of artwork or, or artist, so go either direction, that you saw something from or saw that thing and said, why don't more people know about this or this person? Oh man, uh, it almost goes back to, it almost goes back to that same kind of thing. Um, there's a lot of really talented photographers in the space that people do not know about that they have small followings on Instagram and in the NFT space, they're, they're huge, they're blowing up, they're doing amazing. And it goes to show you that Instagram has really become not what it intended to be or not what we intended it to be as creatives. And that is showcasing amazing work and stories. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the NFT space is allowing that to happen regardless of your social clout following, whatever it is that you had on Instagram. And I think that's amazing um, that you can just focus on the craft and the story and who the person is. And then that's the stuff that's going to be long. That's going to have a lot of longevity. Um, and I think that's important. And I don't, you know, gaining a following on Instagram has never meant anything to me. It's always been, this is happening almost passively. And I'm just showcasing the things that I'm taking photos of and I'm connecting with cool people. And the more people that see it is really special to me because I can connect with more people that are like-minded. That's the only reason, not because numbers do anything. Um, I had a very successful commercial career that had nothing. I could have zero followers on Instagram and I would have still had that. So it's all about connecting and the NFT space is about discovering people who are connectors. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's you can find amazing artists that have entered the space, drop cool stuff, and then they may end up potentially even leaving or not following through and not have longevity for whatever reason. But the people who are connecting to other people and constantly making those, you know, finding the new artists, connecting them, talking with them, bringing resources. Um, those are the people that I think you always want to follow no matter where they go, what space they're in. Well said, well said. You passed the lightning round. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Flying colors. <laughs> Not very lightning, but we, we got through it. <laughs> That's great. It's, it's always, I, I can't recall one lightning round without at, at least one story woven into there. So it just happens naturally. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's something that I think we're storytellers and we're filmmakers and we're, we're artists and we're, we're going to, you know, we want to talk more about stuff and we love this. So I, I really appreciate you, you know, having the right questions to ask. Of course, man. It, from the, from the moment um, the idea was hatched, it was a magnet. It was, as I've told many people, many times, I couldn't really do anything else. I wanted to know, like I want, I personally wanted to know the context, be able to ask the questions when I saw, you know, a piece of artwork and maybe another piece of artwork and stories started to formulate in my head, there were just certain things that I thought maybe there are others who would also want to know those answers and get into the, the same virtual room with that artist. And what I've learned is that also in many cases, that amazing human being and, and just jam on things. Totally. Yeah. The, the more I get to know other artists in the space that I didn't know about before, um, you know, I was, I was saturated with photographers for the most part because of just where, you know, I, I helped onboard video onto Instagram. I, I was there at the early days of Instameets. I was, you know, <clears throat> all the history of Instagram, I can go back and be like, I was part of something there. And then within the last few years when they've kind of changed directions. And I think it was really when stories came along, the entire company really changed directions. Um, but just seeing that happen and then realizing there's so many artists in this space, 3D, whatever it is, um, NFTs have just brought so many walks of life together and you start to discover new people with new amazing stories. 
And those are, those are just, just the start of what's going to come and then what NFTs and art together can do. Just the start. Yeah. Speaking of just the start, Ravi Vora, as we wrap here on your origin story, what's next? What's next? So I've got a few projects in the works. Uh, I'm working on a few more of the Tempest. Uh, more photos are coming. Uh, I want to mint more of my story and have that out there. I want to do some, uh, some drops that I've collaborated with a few artists. Like I've talked about, unfortunately, can't show anything or talk about them just yet. Um, so they'll be coming out soon. I think uh, as I work on these, these new projects, uh, I'm going to be managing my time a little bit on how, you know, the collaboration side, as well as the, the being able to share things uh, or mint things that I feel are really strong in the portfolio. And, uh, and as I do that, I'm also still working on filmmaking, storytelling on that side, writing. Uh, I want to do something in the space that has to tie that together. And, uh, and these are going to be pieces. So the collectors that I have, the people that end up being part of the early story are going to have a lot of uh, return in the long run when the full story is un un unveiled and revealed and everyone has pieces. Um, it's kind of like, imagine watching a Spielberg film and seeing in the background and you, you're like, oh, I actually have that action figure. When yeah. I was a kid, I, I had that. That's what it's going to feel like uh, for my story as an artist, because that's just who I am. I'm a, I'm a storyteller. I'm a filmmaker. And, you know, I'm going to include things later down the road that are going to be within this uh, holistic view of what I do. So that's why I think um, this, this kind of blockchain uh, environment where we can always see the history of things is going to be uh, an incredible story and journey. Of, they, you can point back and say, I've been part of this and then I'm seeing this now and everyone can you know, feel that nostalgia. And how fun is that too for, for an early collector who may have had no sense of expectation and, and found you organically through, through somebody else, however, um, and has collected this piece and then be able to have that, as you put it, that Spielberg moment later and say, Oh, that's, Oh, I know that. Yeah. That's an interesting concept. Totally. Yeah. I, I love that. And I want, you know, to me, even when I collect things, I'm like, I am collecting now because of the artist's story mm -hmm. and I want to see where they go. I, I want to support their vision and, their, and, and what they're doing and who they are. And if, if we're only looking at the art, sometimes we may miss that. But mm -hmm. if we look at an artist and a body of work, it doesn't matter what they're creating. If they're creating photography or 3D or, or painting or, or music, it's really about uh, supporting somebody who's going to create and tell a story long term. Mm -hmm. Well, Ravi, I think I speak for many of us, but keep creating, keep telling your story long term. Uh, there's so much here. I feel like we had five areas where we could break out and have a whole nother hour and a half together to go down some other rabbit hole. Um, I very, very much appreciate this time. And please tell people where can they find you? Of course, I'll put that in Twitter show notes as well, but just here verbally, where can they find you? Yeah. So uh, socials, you can find me at Ravi Vora on almost everything on Twitter at Ravi Vora, Instagram at Ravi Vora foundation at Ravi Vora. And uh, I believe I was I was verified on OpenSea right away, even though I had no idea what that meant. Uh, I do have stuff on there and I'm hoping to, I'm hoping that platforms are, I, I love the idea of platforms and marketplaces, but I think in the future, we're going to find that we really want to just connect with the artists. So I would say, you know, connect on my socials first and then you'll find the other stuff as it comes, as uh, other platforms and things arise and we figure that out. Makes sense. Can't wait to see what's next. Can't wait for some of these collaborations to be announced. Yeah, yeah, coming soon. <laughs> TM. <laughs> All right, man. Talk Thanks soon and thank much. you for your time. Thanks, Rob.